Let's bring in our political insiders, John LeBoutlier, former Republican congressman for New York, and Pat Cadell, a former pollster for President Jimmy Carter and Fox News contributor, and Doug Schoen, former pollster for Bill Clinton and a Fox News contributor as well. Gallup's everyday poll, as we like to call it, out not even four hours shows this, gentlemen. Let's pop that up on the screen. The president's approval rating sliding even more to 41 percent. Doug, you had the job of breaking polling news to a former president. What are they telling this president about these numbers? Very good question. Harris, they are telling the president he must change the dynamic. That's what the apology was about. That's what uh, the Democratic senators who went in last week were coming in to the her. secret meeting in the secret meeting that was not so secret, which is, Mr. President, we're all at risk unless you can do something about uh, the individual mandate and the penalties and the fact that people are losing their coverage. Bottom line, this is crisis time in the White House, Harris. The Democrats understand that the president is at or close to all-time lows, and the administration is literally in a crisis. All right, John, I'm going to go to you next. I don't know when the RNC starts to spend money. Maybe it's way too early. But, but is it time for them to maybe pull together a single mes message and put out an ad or two? I, I don't know how well, they do it. Pat and Doug and I have been saying what they ought to do is get first a unified health care proposal for the Republican alternative to Obamacare, and that's all they talk about uh, as a mm. positive. Instead of criticizing someone, say, while they're going down, here's what we would do. But they don't do that. They have 500 different things floating around. Let me just say this to, to follow up on Doug, too. Panic is not too strong a word to use about the Democrats. And the proof of it was Friday when Senator Landrieu, who's up for re-election in Louisiana, a Democrat, mm -hmm. flew on Air Force One and then got the hell out of there and would not be at a public event yeah, with no the president. When you're in the same party as the president and you do not want to be photographed with the president, what does that tell you? The president is a millstone around the Democrats' neck. Pat, uh, you agree? You know, Pat, I, I want to put up those numbers again, if we can, with the president's approval rating. And, and I don't think it's overstating. It's starting to slide like he looks like a member of Congress now. His, <laughs> right. his disapproval up above 53. Can he get he, through this? He's been sustaining in over 50 percent disapproval for a couple of weeks now. The problem is, is the panic in the what's happening for 2014. If the Republicans had both, as John said, a message on health care, a message on economic and economic growth message, had a positive alternative to offer and put the Democrats against the wall, which they haven't, you could see from this meeting with the Democrats in the Senate that, look, they had the, the, when the 14 people are up, a dozen of them are up, and they all voted for Obamacare and it's falling apart on them, they're worried. The same thing is developing in Iran. Because the Jewish, when when Bay, well, excuse me, when Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, comes out this week and says, is basically the subtext, Israel's being sold down the river. What are you Democrats going to do? Then you have the announcement that there may be tougher sanctions. You said this is all bad news, and that's why the president tried to change it. That that useless apology of his, by the way, the one without a bit of emotional. And, and by I did nothing, you know, doesn't doesn't solve the problem. But that's why they keep trying to change the agenda. What they're hoping for is the Republicans will give them something. Right now, it is deteriorating. It is the drip by drip. I have lived this process in the White House. It is a disaster when it starts this way. Uh, all right. And I want to tell our audience, too, that we will be talking about uh, Iran and the talks that ended, at least temporarily, in Geneva, Switzerland, coming up. Um, but I want to press in with you a little bit, Doug. And I wrote this down. You said sure. it is crazy crisis time in the White it House. Is. If, in fact, the Republicans can do, though, what John is suggesting, yeah. it could be, what is that, like crisis times two for the White House? It, it could, but, Harris, it's a big if, because the Republicans have been unable to singularly articulate a message about a cross-border insurance no purchase, tort reform, uh, giving people vouchers to buy health care. They're not doing that. But bottom line, with people being canceled, 
uh, by insurance companies right. with premiums being much higher than they expected, even without the message. And the message is important, as Pat and John say, but even without it, it is really crisis time. You know, Pat, you said something, and, and I want to bring it up, but I'm going to ask John to respond to it. You said the emotional disconnect. There's an emotional disconnect between what the president said and his apology and how he's handling us. Uh, is there a place for Republicans to step in with some emotion now? Well, you know, the best thing for them at the moment is to stay out of this thing. Let the, the Democrats, they voted for this thing. Not one Republican voted for Obamacare in either the House or the Senate. Let the Democrats, I'm talking now politics, okay, not human beings. Because I hate to see our fellow Americans getting these letters and looking at each other over the dinner table saying, yeah. God, we don't have any insurance. That, now, that, that is the human thing. And I don't think right. Obama really does relate to it. But... But politically, you're asking me, the Republicans ought to be off the stage for a while. Let the Democrats oh, kill no, themselves. No, let the people whose stories are out there be center, center, mm. at the center of this. This is where the emotional story. The president shows no connection. And his supporters, even today on Fox this morning, with the head of the family, U.S., whatever it is, Mr. Pollock. I mean, their attitude is, oh, you people are too dumb to know what you want. We have to do this for you. It is a callousness. And I think the president got away with murder with that apology because what was lacking was something whether Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter or some other Democrat would have done, which is actually feel some pain for these people mm. because he's such a narcissist. He can't. And here's the problem with the Democrats. Soon what the Republicans need to do is get these things. Democrats are producing them. You keep your affordable health care bill. They need to start what they should have done in September. Keep putting these Democrats on the, against the wall how they're going to vote. They don't do that. They keep coming up with these we are moving though towards those 14 democrats mm -hmm. joining with the republicans to delay the individual mandate for a year. It's so you know interesting, that's though, that, because that was part of the conversation prior to the shutdown. Right. That was something that, that you were right. talking about, we, we, were we, talking, talked about we were talking about it, but here's the issue. The Democrats have been held in lockstep by the president for almost three, three and a half years on health care, Harris, and the big deal is that they're breaking ranks. John refers to the individual mandate potentially being delayed. Pat refers to the po possibility that the Keep Your Doctor Act could pass, saying the president has to commit himself to what he promised, that Congress would mm -hmm. pass that legislation. Bottom line, the Democrats are defecting because they see the impact on them if, being potentially collapsed. Uh, all right, guys, we, we got to go to the commercial break and just... Hold those thoughts for just a second. And gentlemen, I want to start with Governor uh, Chris Christie's win in New Jersey. And he made the Sunday talk show rounds. Let's listen to a little bit of the governor today. And I want to talk about a possible run for the White House and whether you think it's on his mind. Watch. And, you know, at the end of the day, Chris, here's, here's what people in Washington, D.C. don't understand. If you want to win a vote by that kind of margin, if you want to attract a majority of the Hispanic vote, if you want to nearly triple your African-American vote, you need to show up. You need to go into those neighborhoods. You need to campaign in places. John, is he running? Oh, he's definitely running. He's been running for years. That's not a, a, never a doubt. The question really with him is he is a better, appears to me, a better general election candidate than he is a, a survivor of the Republican meat grinder of these primaries. That's where I think he's going to have a tough time. You know, I want to read uh, a tweet, and I've invited everybody to talk about this on my Twitter page, at Harris Faulkner, because a lot of people say it's just too soon to be talking about this. But um, Mikey's Monkey, which I've long suspected <laughs> is not his real name at birth, says that Christie is out for Christie and no more. Your thoughts? Well, well, that's on the right. People have thought that. But let, let's let Doug... You know. Yeah, no, I, what I was going to say is Christie is an opportunistic politician, a shrewd one. But the point John is making, particularly people on the right, see him as somebody who is uh, with President Obama during Sandy as he was. Now he's calling himself a conservative, and he's just not as conservative as much of the Tea Party and the Republican Look, right is. Look, the real question is, if you look at his victory, which is pretty impressive, 51 percent of Hispanics, you know, 30 some percent of Democrats, 21 52 percent, 57 percent of women, 20 some percent of African Americans. Look, that's very impressive for the way Republicans have been running. Look at Virginia, the disaster in Virginia. But, the, you know, the thing is, and, and Doug was talking, we were talking about this earlier, 
if if Virginia, if you had not had third party candidates, but most of all, if you'd had the lieutenant governor, there's a poll out today showing the lieutenant governor run he was beating, but have beat McAuliffe by six points. It is taking candidates who are too extreme or not supporting them. Or the other problem is, imagine where they would be if they had not had the shutdown. I mean, this is that you know, cost Virginia. The, the, the cost of the republic i want to go back to new jersey and governor yeah. christie uh, a viewer on twitter has said h reno 24 tweeted let him be governor already too early for this that's, kind that's of really stuff. the challenge harris he said in that fox news sunday interview he's got to be governor head of the republican of the national governors association he will get to a campaign in a year or two but bottom line now he has to perform real quickly air apparent on the flip side of the political aisle is it hillary clinton i understand she and her husband are, are gaining support in California this weekend. I, I, absolutely. The Clintons are the consensus choice. Big win for them in Virginia with McAuliffe. Bottom line, they are the nominee if they seek the nomination. Okay, but a poll, Fox News exit poll from last week showed only four points difference if a national election were run now between Governor Christie and Hillary Clinton. But that's in New Jersey. And that's and only that's in New Jersey. that's taken the day that Governor Christie is winning almost 60% of the vote for Look. governor. So. so you don't think, John, that it translates nationally? Well, I think it's very early for both of them, you know. And I think Hillary, Doug is right. If Hillary runs, she's the automatic Democratic nominee, which is great. You're halfway to the White House without having to do a thing. All right, let's talk Iran. Uh, a lot of news coming out last week about the White House loosening sanctions on Iran as recently as September 10th. Pat, why are they doing that? Well, because basically because the Israelis, as I indicated before, the Israelis are saying this deal doesn't work and you have an election coming up and you have a lot of northern Democrats who have been going along with the administration. The president kept tell telling Jewish supporters and others who support Israel, I'm for Israel, right up to now, this deal to have Netanyahu, the been prime minister, come out and assault it in English the way he did in Sneer deal or whatever they're doing in their desperation. Let me just say one thing. The one thing I know about Poland, because I've done it on Iran, I've seen it on Iran, is that Iran is not Syria or Libya. The Americans view Iran as a real danger, them having nuclear weapons is a danger, and that they'll right. give them the terrorists. Uh, here is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the subject. Let's watch. This is a country that has uh, you know, tens of thousands of people in the street chanting death to America the other day. It's not only my concern that this is a bad deal. There are many, many Arab leaders in the region who are saying this is a very bad deal for the region and for the world. Doug, if you're Israel, what are you thinking about the way the White House is handling this? You're scared. And the reason you're scared is the proposed deal allows the Iranians to keep the uranium that they've already enriched it freezes production, allegedly. But with sanctions relaxed and with the West and the president wanting a deal even more than the French, bottom line, the Israelis see this as an existential threat. They are scared to death, and we are facing a real conflict in the region between the United States and Israel, and with the Saudis equally scared. You and know, hearing Saudis, you say that, I'm sorry, John, real quickly. I was going to say the Saudis are going to get a nuclear bomb from Pakistan to counter Iran if Iran gets this, away with this building. Is a you know, it's interesting hearing you guys saying this. We saw Secretary of State John Kerry rush off to Geneva, Switzerland. We thought, well, is a deal imminent? And, and then we hear from Benjamin Netanyahu. You got to wonder, maybe he should have been rushing off to Israel. He was to just talk in Israel. Prime Minister. He, was, exactly. he was just there. Well, All right, I wouldn't we trust go. John Kerry as far as I could throw him. Uh, he okay. wants to do this deal so badly. They're still talking and you can continue the conversation with them <laughs> and I know you want to do that uh, online foxnews.com Mondays at 10:30 a.m. Eastern with the political insiders